In this example, we're going to find the locations of the absolute extrema, if they exist, for the polynomial function f of x equals 3x to the fourth minus 4x cubed minus 12x squared plus 2. Now, one thing I want to mention here is that if we just looked at the in behavior of this function, if we took the limit as x approaches plus or minus infinity of f of x, uh, because it's a polynomial function, this will be the same as taking the in behavior of its leading term, 3x to the fourth, as x approaches plus or minus infinity. For which case, in both cases, this will go off towards infinity. Basically, what I'm saying is if you just kind of sketch the general picture of the graph, we know it's going to point up on the right-hand side. We know it's going to point up on the left-hand side. And it's going to maybe squiggle in the middle. Uh, it's clearly too many squiggles for, <laughs> for a, a degree 4 polynomial. But we can anticipate something like this happening. Uh, three turning points in the middle. Uh, I don't know how many there are necessarily. We could find them by calculating the derivative, which we'll do that in just a moment. But what we can see here is because it's going off towards infinity on both sides, we can see that this graph has no absolute maximum value. So because that's the issue, this function, although it's continuous, we don't have a closed finite interval. And so the extreme value theorem doesn't apply in this context. So the, extre the absolute extrema might not exist. We do see that the we see there's no absolute maximum, but there has to be some type of absolute minimum. Now, I don't exactly know where these turning points are happening, but you know, if you're, if you're positive infinity on the left and you're positive infinity on the right, then in between, there's got to be some place that's finite. And the smallest finite value, because it doesn't go off towards negative infinity, guarantees there is an absolute minimum. So even when the, the extreme value theorem doesn't apply, we can be guaranteed some absolute extrema if we investigate the graph. So let's figure out where those are. Um, there are no boundary points because we're going off towards infinity or negative infinity. So I guess you could actually think of the boundary points themselves are infinite. So it's like negative infinity, infinity are our x values. And then if we plug those into the function, we're going to get positive infinity and positive infinity. I'm not going to say infinity is the absolute maximum because that's not a number. But we see that there is no absolute maximum because we can get bigger, 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 bigger. What about the function? Well, we need to find the critical numbers here to figure out where that minimum value is going to be. So we calculate the derivative. So f prime of x by the usual power rule, we're going to get 12x cubed minus 12x squared minus 24x. Uh, the two will disappear because, well, it's a constant. We, we take the derivative of the constant, it goes to zero. Our goal is to figure out where is the derivative equal to zero, where is the derivative undefined. The derivative is a polynomial, so it's not, it's not, it's not undefined anywhere. This function is differentiable everywhere, but it could equal zero, so we need to factor it. Looking at the terms, we see there is a common, uh, the greatest common divisor is going to be a 12x. We, could, we can factor it out. That leaves behind x squared minus x minus 2, for which that also very conveniently uh, factors, does it not? It'll factor... We need factors of negative 2 that out to be negative 1. We're going to get x minus 2 and x plus 1. So this tells us our critical numbers are going to be x equals 0 from this one. We're going to get x equals 2 from this factor. And we get negative 1 for this one right here. So we write those in our table. So we're going to get negative 1, 0, and 2. Now plug these numbers into the function. So for example, if I plug in 0, 0, 0, you get a 2. So f of 2, so f of 0 is equal to 2, excuse me. If you plug in negative 1, so f of negative 1, you're going to get 3 plus 4 minus 12 plus 2. So 2 and 3 and 4, excuse me, are 7 plus 2 is 9 minus 3. That's going to give us a negative 3, which we add that to our table. And then lastly, we have to do f of 2. So f of 2, you're going to get 3 times 16, which is 48, minus, well, uh, 2 cubed. Did I say that first one right? 2 to the 4th is 16 times 3 is 48. Uh, then the next one, you get 4 times 2 cubed. 2 cubed is 8 times 4 is going to be 32. And then the next one, you're going to get a negative 12 times 4, so that's 48. So those conveniently cancel out. And then you get a plus 2. So it looks like we get a negative 30 when we're done. Just doing the calculation there. And so the absolute minimum value is going to have to occur at the smallest value in this table, which we see is negative 30. So this function does, in fact, have an absolute minimum value. And the value is y equals negative 30 and occurs when x equals 2. 
So kind of like our graph suggested, although the, the exact picture isn't quite right, it was just a guess, right? But the, we knew there was gonna be an absolute minimum value. It happened when X equals two, we're gonna get Y equals negative 30. And there is no number in the range smaller than, than Y equals negative 30. What if we do the same problem over again, but now we require a finite interval from negative one to negative one. So remember the table we did just a moment ago. Let's keep that table for a moment. We had infinity, we had negative one, zero, two, and infinity. We don't have to reinvent the wheel when we do this problem. So we had infinity, negative three, two, negative 30, then negative, uh, positive infinity, excuse me. So if we restrict it just to negative one to one, then we have to include the endpoints. Uh, the endpoints before were positive and negative infinity. I guess that should be a negative infinity there, shouldn't that be? Uh, now the endpoints are gonna be negative one and one. We wanna grab every critical number that's between negative one and one, which that would be negative one and zero. Notice that two, although it's a critical number, it, well, it was where the absolute minimum was before, but it's no longer in the interval. So we just gonna get negative one, zero and one. Some of these we already did. We're gonna put this into the function. Don't put this into the derivative, put this into the function. F of negative one was negative three. F of zero was equal to two. We haven't done F of one yet. Uh, so plugging that back into our function, F of one turns out to be 12, excuse me, three times one to the fourth minus four times one cubed minus 12 times one squared plus two. Because uh, we're just taking powers of one, this will just look like a three minus four minus 12 plus two. So again, three minus four is negative one plus two is positive one minus 12 is negative 11, like so. And so in terms of absolute maximum and minimum, now that we have a closed interval, we see that the maximum value does exist. There is an absolute maximum and it occurs at X equals zero. That's because X equals zero was a local maximum. And while the total graph had no absolute maximum because it goes off towards infinity, if we shrink the picture down, right? So our picture looks something like this. This is the total picture. But if we just zero in on basically this picture right here, just look inside of that green box right here, then there is a maximum value. It happens right here at x equals zero. Uh, it'll be the maximum value will be y equals two. And there is an absolute minimum, right? It doesn't coincide with two. It coincides with one, actually. This is gonna be our absolute minimum value. So we see here we have an absolute maximum at y equals two. And we have an absolute minimum at y equals negative 11. So what I wanted to do in this example was demonstrate one more time how we can solve extreme value problems, that is find the absolute maximum and minimum. If you have a closed interval, you're guaranteed to have an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum. If your interval is not closed, like with the original one, we did the whole real line, those things might not be guaranteed. But even if we're not guaranteed an absolute max or min, we can still use calculus and a bit of geometry to help us find these, uh, these absolute max and absolute minimum. Because sometimes, Sometimes if our picture looks something like this, we don't care about the absolute ma maximum, right? What if this, for example, is a cost function? Do we want to find maximum cost? No, no, we want to find minimum cost. And so this is the only value we care about. And this is something we're going to see later on in this chapter as we eventually approach something called optimization problems, where we want to find the best thing to do, and that'll coincide with finding an absolute extremum.